Hello, Guilty Feminists. It's Deborah. Now, you might have noticed that there has been a brand new episode every single week, including Christmas, for seven and a half years. And that is very rare for a podcast. So lately, we've put out some best ofs. And I've never wanted to do that before. But we've had an amazing response of people going, thank God, the Guilty Feminists are finally doing some best ofs. Um, Because a lot of podcasts do this. And I know it's true. It is enjoyable to listen to them. Um, I have found lately, I've wanted to spend more time on the episode I do and not spread myself so incredibly thin. So what I thought we're going to do is we're going to do slightly fewer brand new episodes, but pour more energy, time and focus into them. And on weeks when we haven't got a brand new episode, we're going to go back through the archives and we're going to find something timely, newly relevant, fondly nostalgic, or just really funny and interesting and share that with you again. But I'm going to do an introduction or we're going to get one of our hosts, you might have heard some of these episodes, uh, to compile something that means something to them. It might be an episode where I interview somebody in the studio rather than doing a, a live a theatre show. And then the live theatre shows, which there'll still be loads of, um, we'll just have that little bit more time and energy to make them spectacular. So we start with an episode from October 2017. That's a long time ago. Feels so long ago, doesn't it? Because it's before the pandemic. So anything before the pandemic, you just go, what? In the long before, in the long ago time. Um, This episode has me and Cal Wilson on stage in Australia talking about Weinstein culture. This is before the full extent of his crimes and violence had been uncovered. It was at the point when he'd checked himself into a sex addiction clinic, but there was no clear indication that he would go to jail for his crimes. As Cal says, we were at the crest of a wave. This wasn't the first point of hashtag me too, nor was it the first mainstream celebrity, but it was the turning point in hindsight. What strikes me re-listening to this is the way in which we were speaking about our own experiences. There was almost a naivety about it. It feels like it's the first time we were speaking openly about the sexism and fear we'd experienced, because in some ways it was. At some points, I think we even were trying to find a way through with levity as a way of therapeutically speaking about our own experiences. All the points bear repeating. We didn't know the extent of Weinstein's crimes at this point, and you can hear the assumption that he would probably get away with it, so excuse our retrospective ignorance, but I'm delighted we were wrong. To start with, we're going to hear one of my favourite I'm a feminist but sections ever, which involved a chance encounter in Cancun and some pure guilty feminist power. I'm a feminist, but of the three years that I kept a diary as a teenager, the entry that stands out the most is this one. July 10th, Simon's birthday. Wasn't able to get near him to wow him out with conversation, so made do with gazing adoringly at his bike. (laughs) Brown 10 speed. All right, prepare yourself for this. I'm a feminist, but I am so excited that I have news of Megan and Alexander from Cancun. I know. Now, if you do not remember this, if you haven't heard the latest episodes, it's a story about a young man who got in touch with me by email very recently saying he'd met a woman while they were both on holidays in Cancun and he'd wanted to share some music with her and he didn't know how to do that and she'd said she was a fan of The Guilty Feminist. And so he asked me if I knew her or could get in touch with her. And I was like, at the time, I was like, if she'd said she was a Game of Thrones fan, would he have gone, dear George R. R. Martin, (laughs) met a girl on the beach in Cancun. Anyway, I got so caught up in the potential romance of this that I ignored the potential creepiness of it. (laughs) And I put a shout out on the podcast for Megan, who had recently been in Cancun. I've got news, gang. I'm a feminist, but as much as I'm always thrilled to hear from women who've had feminist revelations or growth from the podcast, I've never been more excited than when Megan got in touch and said, put me in touch with Alexander! I'm a feminist, but every year when I'm choosing a photo for my comedy festival poster and the graphic designer says, would you like me to Photoshop the bags out from under your eyes? I say, yes, please! (laughs) You know, it's not like I get my boobs enlarged in the photo, although I did do that on one poster. Um, (laughs) It's all right. It was because I was topless. Um, (laughs) It's okay. My boobs were covered by two crossed TV remotes, and the fact that I could hide my whole chest with two TV remotes does suggest why I wanted them enlarged. 
I'm a feminist, but I was too excited when I got this email from Megan in response to my question, what was Alexander like? She said, so here's the thing. I was chatting with a guy on one of my first evenings there. He was there for a wedding. Nice guy. But then I found out he was a Trump supporter. And well, she says, well, not a whole lot to say there. I was then talking to a guy on my last night and we got on really well and there was plenty of tequila had. I'm so bad with names that either of these men could be Alex. I don't know why he wants to send me music. I'm very intrigued. Also, I live in London. I hope the poor guy doesn't think I live in Brooklyn. He had implied that she did. That's where he lives. So she says, yeah, maybe an e-intro is the way forward. We've come this far. I was so excited by the rom-com twist that I was kind of delighted by the Trump supporter element because I thought it was good plotting. It it sounds a little bit like the prequel to Mamma Mia. Like... It's not, not that. I mean, it's exciting, guys, isn't it? You can see why I was thrilled that one of them was a Trump supporter. That's not right. That's not right at all. But I'm not wrong when I say it's good plotting. I'm a feminist, but when my boyfriend and I went out for our three-year anniversary, I decided that he'd take me to a fancy restaurant because he was going to propose. But when he didn't know that's what he was supposed to do... I got angrier and angrier over dinner when it didn't happen. And he couldn't work out why I was so furious by the time we got home. In my defence, he had said to me, I've only got you a small present, but I think you'll like it. Uh, And when it turned out not to be an engagement ring, but a platypus boot scraper... (laughs) I was fucking livid. We've been married for 10 years now. He did eventually get it together. And my ring is a platypus. It's not. I'm a feminist, but I'm kind of delighted by what happened next with Alexander and Megan. (laughs) This is the email exchange that Megan sent me. This is from Alexander to Megan. Hi, Megan. I wanted to get in touch with you since I figured you'd appreciate some good house music. Check out my likes on SoundCloud. I tried to get all the good stuff on there. I hope you're doing well and your endeavours are on their way to success. I hope you remember me. We met on one of your first nights in Cancun. (laughs) Remind me, you live in London right now and you have a crazy aunt that lives in New York. Megan replies, hello, Alex. Wow, that was a big effort to send someone some house music. Thanks. (laughs) Yep, I live in London and my sane aunt lives in Brooklyn. I'd like to live in Brooklyn, but unfortunately not right now. Not when the country is currently run by an anti-feminist, racist, racist, sexist, pro-NRA, pro-white supremacy, homophobic, vagina-grabbing, sociopathic pervert like Trump. Maybe someday. Best of luck with your future decisions and endeavours. Megan, smiley face. (laughs) She adds to me, so disappointing, it was the Trump supporter. Ah, well, it could have been something beautiful, but unfortunately this is life and not a 90s Meg Ryan film. (laughs) Thanks for trying to find the love of my life, heart. Megan, kiss, kiss. P.S. I remember in Cancun, I asked him, what the hell do your friends think of you voting for Trump? And he said, oh, they don't know. He's a closet Trump supporter, which is worse. I just need Cal to verify, because this sounds so good. It's like I've made it up. Can you please just verify that email is real? Obviously, I can't read out the real name. I'm going to email him as well. No. (laughs) It's so good. It's totally real. So I'm a feminist, but although this involves a Trump support, I just, I'm so happy with the way it went. Because she just slammed him. She just served him. I just can't wait to see if he emails back. What I'm concerned about now is that there are going to be a lot of other people emailing to see if they can get in touch with Megan now, because she fucking rocks. Oh. 
Oh, that's a nice thought. No, it isn't. No, that's not. I, this Guilty is not a dating fem- service. Guilty feminist Tinder. No, we can't have that. We cannot. We cannot have that. Anyway, I wrote to her and said, is it okay if I read this out on the podcast? And I haven't heard back from her. So, <laughs> so if this doesn't go out on the edit, it's because she went, no. And then we've just heard it here collectively and it's our secret. I suspect she's going to say yes because I'm going to say the audience thought you were a huge legend. <laughs> Live from Giant Dwarf in Sydney. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. Today, Weinstein culture, we're talking about power misuse. Uh, We're talking about the culture, not Weinstein himself, although obviously he comes into his own culture. So we're talking about the exploitation of certainly sexual power and how does that environment fester and develop? Do you have a sort of sense of what's happening at the moment, like the landscape? I feel like we're on the cusp of a tidal wave, which is not really a phrase, but... um, (laughs) We're riding the edge of an undertow. I feel like we're... um, I feel like this is a moment when everyone has just finally gone, oh, for fuck's sake, we've had enough. And I feel like I've been really overwhelmed by all of the Me Too stories and have felt so sad. And I felt like hearing about... Weinstein. I keep getting his name wrong. It's like I refuse to pronounce yeah, his name correctly. I've been calling him Weinstein. Weinstein. Oh, Weinstein. Weinstein, just because... <laughs> why not? Why, why give him any respect? But I've felt this, like, solid sorrow in my chest when I think about all of the people mm. that he's hurt. But at the same time, I feel this real hope that there are all these women coming out and saying, it happened to me too, and that there are all these other women and men going, fuck, that's awful, I believe you, and I feel like we're poised on the brink of, you know, he's only one guy, like, it's not like, oh, we've found the guy, we've found the guy, we've found the guy, there's no more guy. It's all right, guys. You can come out, ladies. The guy that's been doing all the sexually harassing is now in a sex addiction spa in Switzerland. Yeah. For as long as he wants to be. I mean... So everything's good. Yeah. Poor guy, he must have been exhausted, just flying all around the world, doing all of the harassment. All of the harassment. All of the harassment. (laughs) But yeah, I feel like it's been a painful thing, but it's a hopeful thing at the same yeah, time. Yeah, me too. All right, so uh, do you have a challenge, Cal? Uh, so my challenge that I gave myself was just to do a Me Too, because when it started, I was like, oh, this is amazing, but I don't think I want to join in. And then there was just more and more people doing it. And there's been lots of occasions when, you know, awful things have happened, but for some reason, there was just one tiny one that really stuck in my mind from when I was a teenager. So I have just written a little piece about it. Me Too. And you too, probably. More than likely. Read the stories on my Facebook. The women I love and admire and hold precious, sharing tentative tales or fragments of fear or raging accounts that read like red-hot weapons. My timeline brimmed with hashtag tears and all I could think was the sad react button isn't enough and now we need a reaction for heartbreak. And all I could do was add my love and say, I'm sorry and I'm angry and I believe you and I hear you and if you don't want to say anything, you don't have to. And to finally feel the echoes of that sorrow for myself. I remember all the small times, the flashing, the groping, the near misses. I remember the times I didn't get off so lightly and the times that I did. I remember my supermarket manager when I was 17 who used to stand too close and tug on my plaits and call me Pocahontas and how the checkout supervisors kept their eyes on him always. And nothing was ever said. There was just a low-level sense of danger, a background hum like a too-loud refrigerator or a fan. I remember how he insisted I come into the cash room with him and how I could barely hear the sound of him locking the door over my own heart. I remember the moment of silence swelling between us. Then the supervisor, bless the supervisor, calling my name over the PA saying I was needed at the checkouts now. I remember my strangled blurt of, I have to go, and his disappointed annoyance. And when I got back to the checkout, nothing was said, except by looks, but we all knew she'd saved me. And nothing was ever said. There was just a low-level sense of danger a background hum like a too loud refrigerator or a fan. That was lovely, Carla, and also very sad. And it's weird, like I don't know if this is the same for anyone else, if if you've shared a Me Too or not, but it's like I want to go, it's all right, I'm all right, but fuck, it feels really good to just Mm. be able to say that out loud and to, like it felt sad, it's like I'm not... 
I don't feel damaged by that, but I feel really sad for that 17-year-old girl that was so frightened and was too frightened of embarrassment to go, I won't. I won't go in the cash room with you or to stand up for myself because he was the supermarket manager and that the checkout supervisors obviously didn't feel enough power of their own to actually say anything to him. But well, we That's just... why it's worth talking about Weinstein culture because it's not just in Hollywood. It's in supermarkets. It's everywhere. Yeah. The people on the checkouts are terrified for you, but they need their own job mm. more than a lot of Hollywood execs need their job who own their own mansions in Bel Air. Do you know what I mean? Like they need their jobs yeah. and they're going, we don't want that to happen. We're keeping an eye, but you know, it happens everywhere. The wonderful, the fabulous, the brilliantly feminist, Cal Wilson! I have have all these sort of tremulous thoughts about um, Weinstein, and I feel... um, (laughs) I feel like everyone must be shaking in their boots. Woody Allen came out and said he felt sorry for Harvey, and I was like, perhaps this is the best time for you to shut the fuck up. Like, (laughs) um, and I've been fascinated by what Harvey Weinstein has been saying. He released a statement early on to the Times, and in the statement, he said that he'd hired a woman lawyer to tutor him on how to deal with women properly, and that she'd put together a team of people to help him learn how to do it. And I was like, what? Like, like, I could just imagine after like some really intense coaching that he'd come bursting out into the boardroom and go, guys, guys, it turns out ladies are people. They're not decorative sex robots. They have feelings. I love the things that he said. I brought on therapists and I plan to take a leave of absence from my company. He didn't need to because they fired his ass. <laughs> and deal with this issue head on. I so respect all women and regret what happened. I feel that he doesn't quite know what respect means. Like, um, maybe he's confused it with like, I feel with my hands. Maybe he thinks that's what respect is. Like, English is a second language and he's got those two words confused because in the language that he speaks, they're very similar. I I also like that he said, regret what happened. I don't think that's a strong enough phrase. Like you say, I regret what happened when you get drunk and you accidentally put your foot through a fish tank or something like that. (laughs) Or, you know, you wazzed on the neighbour's car. Like, I was very drunk. I regret what happened. Like, you can say that. You can't say that for what he's been doing. Uh, He also said, you know what? We all make mistakes. And we do. He's right. Like, you can't fold from that. We all do make mistakes. But again, a mistake is something like you put diesel in your petrol tank. (laughs) Or um, you accidentally clicked on, I am carrying dangerous goods when you were checking in. (laughs) I've done that. It's a fucking nightmare. Uh, (laughs) A mistake is not decades of abusing your power and abusing young women. That's not a mistake. And then the thing that I cannot stop thinking about, because the whole thing is so horrific, right? Everything that those women have been through is awful and horrific, and I feel so sorry and so angry that it's happened to them. But the thing I keep fixating on is him wanking into a pot plant. I think everybody keeps fixating on it. So if you don't know the story, he cornered a reporter and then uh, masturbated to completion into a pot plant. Allegedly. I've heard allegedly so much in conjunction with Harvey Weinstein, I feel like it should be the name of his cologne. Like, (laughs) new, allegedly, by Weinstein. I've been thinking about the poor pot plant, like what it must have been like for that pot plant. Like the pot plant is just sitting there like making some oxygen and like increasing the ambulance. And it's like, but I'm inside, why is it raining? Like, Like just a weird... I just keep thinking about and what are the conversations going to be like amongst that pot plant and the other plants in the foyer of that hotel after everyone's gone? And also, I was like, what if the women were just secondary and it was really all about the pot plant? <laughs> like, if it's like, oh, no, he wants to go to a garden centre. We can't take him. Uh, he's been banned from the Chelsea Flower Show for the third year running. Um, but the conversations that that pot plant would have had with the other pot plants, and, you know, there'd be things like, well, you are wearing a very low pot. Uh, if you'd grown thorns, none of this would have happened. Well, it's awful, but were you showing a lot of soil? And then there'd be, there'd be one big rubber plant that was like, well, why don't you fight them off? And then the pot plant would be like, oh, for fuck's sake, Daryl, I'm a fern. I shouldn't have to. 
I think about all the times that I've been in position. Like I used to do impro. I used to I used to dress up as a pixie for money, is what I called it. But we would do corporate mingles in character. So you'd go into a firm's Christmas party and you'd be dressed as a pixie, and then you'd talk to all the people, and and it would be amusing and humiliating at the same time. And what I what I found so much was that we'd be doing this game called puppets, where you as the improvisers provide the voice, but then an audience member will move you, like they have control over your body. And I don't want to victim blame myself, but why would the fucking, why would we think that was a good idea? Like, why would we think that it was a good idea to get drunken people to move our bodies? And I remember this one time on stage, and we were doing puppets, and I was doing a voice, and a guy who we had not asked to come up just ran up from his seat, bent me over, and pretended to fuck me doggy style from behind. And I stood up and pushed him away, and he went and sat back down. And when I told the older male improviser that I was with what had happened, he went, oh, no, I'm sure he wasn't. Uh, Maybe he was just trying to help you up. And I was like, well, that's not how you help people up, is it? Like, (laughs) if you fall down, you don't help someone up by offering them your cock, do you? You don't like, (laughs) here, hold on to this. It's like a branch, but smaller. Like... (laughs) He wasn't trying to help me up. Like, it, well, what I find is that people try to minimise things. When something's uncomfortable, people try and minimise it and bring it back to nothing. Like they, oh no, he can't have been doing that because if he was doing that, then I would have to deal with it. Something would have to happen. I'd have to go to that guy's boss and say he had sexually assaulted one of the other actors. And then things would have to happen. It would be uncomfortable and inconvenient. But if we can minimise it and say, oh, you must have been mistaken, you don't have to do anything about it. And I found it really interesting. I was in a, like a sort of $2 shop recently with a, a male comedian friend of mine. And we were just standing there looking at John inflatable palm trees and things because what else are you going to buy as two adults so we're just chatting we're having a good time and then this elderly man walks up to me and he goes I know who you are you're that New Zealand comedian you're naughty and it was so creepy it was so creepy and he moved away and I turned to my friend and went did you hear that and he went what I didn't hear anything and I was like he just said and I just repeated you're naughty and he was like no no you must have misheard him You must have misheard him. I was like, but what would I have misheard? Like, what did I think he would have said? Oh, you're 40. Like, you know. (laughs) Like, oh, oh, you're sporty. Like, you know, oh, she's in a tracksuit. She looks athletic. Like, I was like, I didn't mishear it. Like, I will admit, I will admit that I do mishear things. Like, my hearing is not the best. I know I did not mishear that, but I do admit that I do mishear things. I, um... I walked into a conversation with another bunch of comedian friends recently and I found out afterwards that what my friend had actually said, she was describing someone as being really determined and she goes, she's such a bulldog. That's what she said, but what I heard her say was, she shat a bulldog. (laughs) Uh, And I was quite surprised because I've lived in Australia for 14 years and that is not a phrase I'd heard before. Um, But it did seem plausible. Um, (laughs) Because you have the most beautiful turns of phrase in this country. You really do. So it's like, um, oh, I was hungry enough to eat the crutch out of a low-flying duck. Like, you're just beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, that's perfect, because I can picture that. You know, I don't want to, but I can picture it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my other favourite Australian phrase, this has got nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I want to tell you. And my favourite Australian phrase is, we're not here to fuck spiders. <laughs> what it means, and I suspect some of our international listeners will not have a clue. What it means is, we're not here to muck around. But why would you say that? (laughs) I just love the idea of someone going, well, we're not here to fuck spiders, and someone else being like, oh shit, I'm in the wrong room. Um, (laughs) I do need to get my hearing tested. I was watching a basketball documentary with my husband the other night and he pointed at the screen and what he actually said was, they look like the courts we walk past, but what I heard him say was, he looks like he's caught the werewolf bus. (laughs) And I was quite surprised again because he's not normally that articulate, right? But the thing is... (laughs) It was such a brilliant description because the guy on screen had a beard. And so, like, you've got a bit of facial hair. I'd say that maybe you'd caught the werewolf bus, like, two stops. You'd just gone two stops, and then you'd gone, not my ride, not my ride. This guy on screen, right, he had gone right to the werewolf bus terminus. He's fully hairy. It is such a brilliant description. I just punch my husband in the shoulder. I go, ha, 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 ha. He totally looks like he's caught the werewolf bus. My husband just looks at me and goes, who the fuck are you? 
what I find is interesting is that when one woman says something, we don't believe one woman. Like, we have to wait till there's more than one woman to tell us that something's going on. But you can't have too many women because then it becomes a coven. So you just have to, you have to hit the right number of women for it to be the right number of women to believe. And what I find so interesting is why don't they believe us? Like, it's not like we're trying to claim that we've seen a ghost, you know, like, although <laughs> they're quite similar, aren't they? You know, like, um, I felt something brush past me and whisper in my ear and I couldn't tell if it was a ghost or a producer. <laughs> that is all I have to say. <laughs> So my challenge is, Nora Ephron, the screenwriter who wrote When Harry Met Sally, there's an amazing documentary that her son made about her after she died. And she uh, said that her mother, who was also a screenwriter, used to say, everything's copy. She said if she came home from school having saying, oh, everything went wrong today and someone was mean to me and this happened, her mother would say everything's copy. And she said, but I think what she meant by that was everything's material. And she said, if you fall over and people laugh at you, that's their laugh. But if you tell the story of you having fallen over, that's your laugh. And I think a lot of the time, we package our trauma as funny stories. Because as soon as I can turn it into an anecdote and other people laugh, it's mine somehow. And also I've made it less dangerous. I've made it less fearful. And that's a lot of times what comedy is doing. But I've realized I've got three stories, uh, one that happened to me, two that happened to other people, that are told like dinner party stories. This Weinstein thing has made me realize it's not a funny story. And I've just kind of gone, how did I not, I knew it wasn't a funny story, but at the same time, how did I not really know this is not a funny story? So I'm gonna tell you three not a funny stories. And then at the end of each show, I'm gonna say, it's a story. And I want you as the audience to say, not a funny story. Okay, so this is the first story. I went to a city as a comedian, and when I landed, there was another comedian I knew at the airport, and he had lost his luggage. And he was very frustrated by this, and he said, I have to have my PlayStation, which is in my luggage, because it's the only way I can not cheat on my girlfriend. If I can play my PlayStation the whole time, that's the thing that will stop me. I then ran into him at the front of one of the shows, and he bought me a drink and we had a chat and then he did his show and I did my show and I went back to my hotel room and God that's him calling now to say stop telling the story I will sue you um, they know they know they sense it um, and a woman who had been tasked with minding him for the production working for the company and again needed her job texted me late at night and said this comedian would like to see you in his room and the person he was seeing was a friend of mine and I was like uh, no that's okay I'm good for seeing him in his room and she texted back and said he really wants to see you in his room and I was like I'm sure he does I'm sure he really wants to see me in his room I do not want to go to his room and she texted back a third time and said he wants to tell you something, he wants to see you, he wants to show you something. And I said, uh, yes, I'm sure he wants to show me something. I do not want to see him. Then he texted me himself saying, my PlayStation didn't turn up. And I was like, that is the lowest possible bar, that I am a substitute for a PlayStation. I mean, at least I want to be an Xbox. That's the story. Not a funny story. He was a much more famous comedian than me, but he always behaved every time I saw him like I could make you or break you, and he couldn't. I was always like, no, you couldn't. You're barely making yourself. And I was furious by it. But I'm aware if I was that bit more isolated in my life, or he was that bit more powerful or a combination of the two, absolutely something much worse could have happened. So it is not a funny story, but I've told it as a funny story. This is a story too. A very influential male theatre practitioner who is very famous was working with a group of very young people on a program. It was one of those programs where young people's writing and performing were being developed. And he said to a young man on the program, I think you're really special. I think you're a fantastic actor. I think there could be a project for you that I'm doing that's like a big sort of grown up professional project, not this sort of young person development thing. I'd love you to come back to my flat and have a chat with you about the project. 
And he was like, oh my God, it's happened. I'm making it. This is it. This is it for me. Oh my God, I am special, as I suspected. Uh, I am better than all my peers. This is the day. It's happening. It's happened. So he went to this person's flat at night, as he'd been asked, and uh, the theatre practitioner said to him, hey, um, oh, now it's this other guy ringing. It's like, <laughs> they know. Oh my God. Um, and so uh, he goes to the guy's flat and he says, oh, well, I've you know, prepared the play I'd like you to look at, um, but why don't I get you a drink? And he said, oh, that would be lovely. And the man left the room and he's sitting there on his own looking at the play and he just feels something on his shoulder and he looks and it is a half tumescent penis. And he just says, ah, oh, no, I'm all right, thanks. <laughs> That's a story, not a funny story. Somehow that's been told at dinner parties. Lots of people in London know this story. And because it's a man, it feels less terrifying. You would never tell that story if that was a woman in any way other than... But it was told like, there's something about, oh, well, he could fight him off. There's a feeling that we get when it's a young man. But of course, there are all of those fears and dangers. And one man can always beat another man. Somebody has to win. What if it's him? And there's also all of the career stuff going on there in his head. It's a totally an abuse of power. The third story is not a show business story. It happened to a friend of mine. She was running her own business and she was young, a startup, young female entrepreneur. And in the industry that she was in, it was very hard to get a meeting, especially as somebody young and you know, on the up. So she said to this chap, I really, really want a meeting with you because he was the right guy to have a meeting with. And she said there'd been a little bit of, like a spark or a little flirtation or something, but nothing more than that. And he'd said, look, I can meet you, but I'm so back to back with meetings. Why don't you come at the end of the day? Like, come at 6.30 and I'll just stay on a bit later. She went, fantastic. And she said, I turned up and I went into the office. And it was all dark. And I thought, you mustn't be here, but the door's open. And then I went through and I saw a light coming from one office at the end of the corridor. And I went down and I was sort of like, hello, hello. I opened the door and she said, there he was lying on his desk, stark naked, and there was a spotlight directed at his erect penis. And I said, what did you do? She said, I thought, quite fancy him. We've had a bit of a flirt. To be honest with you, it's gonna happen at some point, and he's gone to all this trouble. So I hopped on. And I said, oh my God. And she said, yeah, it was one of those things. I just thought, oh, come on, he's gone to all the trouble. But she said, what made it really awful for me is he'd obviously gone and got himself a bit tanked up to have the courage to do this. And at the end, when we'd finished, he leaned down and he'd gone to Burger King or Hungry Jack's and he'd reached down and he picked up a Fanta, a Burger King Fanta, and he started sipping the Fanta. And she said, that to me was the point where it got really seedy. And I was like, that was the point where it got really seedy. It's a story, it's not a funny story. And it's not a funny story because although she had had a flirt with him and she felt enough of a connection, she thought, yeah, actually I'm up for it. And in no way am I shaming her for going for it. The reality is, if that had been any other number of women, that is such a big presumptuous leap that that could be terrifying given there was no one else in the office. If you're listing men, that's only something you should ever do if you are in a functional relationship. And even then, think twice about the spotlight. Well, it's nice to think that she wouldn't be able to find it otherwise. So. <laughs> I just want to reframe it and just go, some of these stories, they are funny, we laugh at them, but actually there's a deep power in them. And while we're all trading them and not recognizing that, it can influence the culture to go, oh, well, I might try that then. Or, oh, well, everyone laughed when they heard the penis on the shoulder story, maybe I'll pop my penis on someone's shoulder. Worst case scenario, it's a funny dinner anecdote. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So I just think we need to frame them. I'm not saying never tell another funny story. I'm saying own the horror. If you tell the funny story, if you get the punchline, go. And I just thought, yeah, it's funny, but actually it isn't funny because look at all of this. Like we just need to recontextualize those stories and actually acknowledge why we make them funny. We make them funny mm. to diminish the horror, I think. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing it. And also, what I found when you told that story about the penis resting on the shoulder, for a moment I was like, was it by itself or was it attached? <laughs> as far as I know, it was attached to a man. This, this, I mean, that's better, isn't it? Like, you'd prefer... The, I mean, of the two scenarios, you would prefer it to be on someone and not just 
But a ghostly penis. A polter penis. <laughs> a ghostly penis. If there was a story that ended with a poltercock, <laughs> I. That's not a funny story, that's a scary story. Look, I think we should pitch it. Um, <laughs> it would be made in Hollywood, it would. That's the irony. Hello, Guilty Feminists. It's Esther Manito here, and I am going on my first ever UK tour. I would love for you to come join me. It's called Hell Hath No Fury. Let's get to the bottom of why us women get so mad. Um, I'll be starting my tour at Soho Theatre on the 17th of August. I'll then be going off to Brighton, Bristol, Oxford, Leeds, Newcastle, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Leicester, and South End. So if you'd like to come along and book some tickets, please go onto my Instagram page, Esther Manito, and the link is in the the bio. Thank you so much and I can't wait for you to join me. Hello Guilty Feminist, this is Deborah. that's DF Dumps. We're recording more live episodes and you can come and see us. Please do. We are live at Soho Theatre in London in August on the 11th, the 12th, the 18th and the 19th. That's August 11th, 12th, 18th and 19th. Get tickets now. We're live from Chichester on the 21st of August. Coincidentally, I'm also doing my play there. I'll tell you about that more in a minute. And we're recording episodes of The Guilty Feminist and Global Pillage... That's a deep cut. We're bringing it back for one episode only at the London Podcast Festival on Saturday the 16th and Sunday the 17th of September. For tickets to any of these shows, go to guiltyfeminist.com and click on Live Shows. I'll be in Chichester, as I mentioned. Did I mention? I mentioned, I think, that I've written a play called Never Have I Ever. It will be on at the Chichester Festival Theatre at the Minerva for the whole of September. Like I'm a proper playwright. I feel like Neil Simon in the 70s. It stars Alexandra Roach, Amit Shah, Greg Wise and our very own Susan McComber. It's about money, sex, power, politics, identity and running a restaurant. For tickets, go to cft.org.uk. You can also get ad-free episodes via Patreon, Apple Podcasts, or Acast Plus. And if you're passing iTunes or Spotify, you felt like leaving us a five-star review, you, we'd love you forever. You can review any individual episode. If you've reviewed us before, you can review us again. It helps other people find the podcast, and it gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling, and it gives us a lovely, lovely buzz. So we'd really appreciate it. Also, if you're not following or subscribing or whatever it is that you have to do, click that button. It really helps us. And now back to the podcast. Would you please welcome to the stage the fabulous Deborah Frances White. I was struggling with the whole Weinstein, the culture around him that I feel supported him. And then I was really delighted just before I came on stage to see that the men of Hollywood had released an open letter about this. So I'm gonna read you this open letter from the men of Hollywood. Dear women everywhere, this is an an open letter to reassure you that we, the men of Hollywood, vigorously reject Harvey Weinstein and his reign of terror and as a sign of our concern and respect, are proceeding to take his name out of the Academy of Motion Pictures official sorting hat. (laughs) We are shocked, shocked, we tell you, to discover that men treat women the way we see them treat women every day. (laughs) We are dismayed that women have been exploited the way they've been openly and consistently exploited since Hollywood was founded. We are outraged that eight seasons of Entourage and a full-length motion picture accurately reflected the world we live in every single day and wasn't a complete fantasy in the manner of Lord of the Rings, as we assumed. (laughs) We and the young women we are currently trying to coerce into a sexual relationship in exchange for the auditions they so desperately need to buy food to eat are equally horrified by the abuses inherent in the system. The women we are right this minute Skyping for a little sugar in exchange for a good word to the right agent, despite their protestations that they do not want us to do this, are as surprised as we are that we are doing this. (laughs) They didn't think it would be like this when they moved from Missouri to follow their love of the craft, and neither did we. We just can't understand how it continues to happen while every day we do nothing to change it. An influential group of us were only saying at a strip club last night, as we deliberately conspired to block a hard-working, talented woman from directing a feature film she's been developing for five years to give it to her less experienced male colleague, 
that it was appalling that Harvey Weinstein has been allowed to operate his completely out of character operation of power abuse within the context of an incredibly egalitarian culture that tells women that they can be whoever they want to be as long as they're under 26. All look as if they are and are happy to work in an environment devoid of women and throbbing with men. Harvey Weinstein is certainly not invited to our next official Hollywood orgy for men over 55 and women under 25 <laughs> and will not be receiving an invitation to our next pin the tail on the ingenue and jacuzzi themed barbecue. <laughs> we are fathers of daughters and so care about women where once we just saw them as tits who could remember lines and hit marks. You may say that this is no argument as Harvey Weinstein himself has four daughters. To that we say, yes, well. <laughs> Can we ask for your help by asking you to join Donna Karen in considering what you wear when you meet us professionally and socially? Look in your wardrobe and ask yourself what blouse and skirt combination says, make me watch you jerk off into a pot plant <laughs> and don't wear that. <laughs> Throw out your ask me to watch you shower jumpsuit because that would be a big help to us. We also wish to say, while we have your attention, that we mourn the loss of our dear friend and colleague Hugh Hefner and his memorial misogyny drinks and plaque unveiling will be held at the Oppression nightclub on the corner of Hollywood and Patriarchy at midnight. <laughs> Ladies, welcome, miniskirts get in free. With all our love, the horrified men of Holly, wouldn't you like to stay and have a drink? Thank you. I do love the way that you can't recognise women until you've got one that you own, you know, like yeah, until yeah. you've got a daughter or a sister or an aunt or a mother, and then you go, oh, that looks quite similar to that other one. <laughs> I know, it's extraordinary, but Harvey Weinstein clearly has looked at his own 22-year-old daughter and not drawn that, even that simple parallel. <laughs> Our guest today is someone who I've known for many years and in fact have often called a chartered feminist. She is an extraordinary equality activist. Um, she's always worked in equality and feminism in some manner or another. She is a brilliant writer and journalist. Please put your hands together and make huge guilty feminist woohooing noises for Christina Zwicker. Yeah. Um, so, Christina, you're an expert in equality. Tell us about some of the things that you've done. So I started out at Ms. Magazine many, many moons ago when magazines were still in print and dinosaurs roamed the earth. And um, when I met Deb, I think I was working at the Equality and Human Rights Commission in the That's UK. That's right. So I've always been a sort of behind-the-curtain feminist. You know, pay no attention to the feminists over there. I'm taking responsibility for all feminism now. I worked on equal pay campaigns, pregnancy discrimination campaigns, campaigned to stop the closure of refuges for women in the UK. And then I moved here and I started working at Our Watch, which is the National Foundation to Prevent Violence Against Women, did that for two years, and then left about a year ago. And a friend of mine said, well, you should start writing again. So that's what I've been doing. And um, now everybody can benefit from my opinions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no longer behind the curtain. So can I ask you, do you think what's happened with Weinstein is a tipping point in some way? Do you feel it's like a... It's a, it's a the cusp of a tidal wave, is, is I believe. the cusp of a tidal wave? <laughs> yes. Is this just, like, topical news, or do you feel it's a seismic shift in our culture? Because I'm a writer, I'll help you with your metaphors. I think I wrote earlier this week, we're at the crest of a wave. Crest, crest of a wave, I'll go with that, sure. You can keep sure. that, it's yours. Um, so, yes, I've done my calculations as the chartered feminist, but um, I reckon that the context has really shifted. And I think forget the stereotype of the angry feminist and give me a cheer if you're all fucking furious feminists now. So we're pretty fucking furious. And I think it's no coincidence that um, Weinstein came at the end. It was almost a year to a day. There's some sort of beautiful symmetry to it that the Weinstein allegations, anything beautiful of this whole mess, but the Weinstein allegations came out almost a year to the day that Pussygate, the video of Trump leaked, almost a year to the day. And in that year, we have felled one dinosaur, sexist after another. So you had Roger Ailes, I don't know if you know him, for our international listeners,
Reuters. He was the head of Fox News. We had Bill O'Reilly also at Fox News brought down. We had numerous cases in Silicon Valley. Like, women are pissed off. This has been a year of being fucking furious. We had a million women march, and now we've got Me Too. So I think that that has palpably changed the environment. And I read this, um, that Rose McGowan apparently had been talking to a reporter at the New York Times for a number of years, and he really wanted to break her story. So when we talk about, you know, why didn't the media, why didn't the media tell this story, there was actually a reporter who wanted to tell her story, and she wouldn't let him. And the quote that I read was she kept saying, it's not time yet. You know, the public consciousness isn't there yet. And the fact that Rose and so many others now, with Me Too, the floodgates have opened, they can sense that the environment has changed. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it, too, because Me Too started 10 years ago as well. It's a, yeah, it was exactly. A, I can't remember her name. It's an African-American woman who started... I, I've got it right thank here, you, Cal. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Tarana Tarana Burke, Tarana Burke. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so it feels like that's been bubbling around and then Rose McGowan has put off talking about it, but now it's sort of time... For things to change. So what do we need to do to make sure that it's not just he goes to rehab and he comes back and he knows and how to... a different bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like how With to, a new potted plant. Well, I mean, the question is, whose responsibility is it to take action? Is it the women who haven't had the power? Actually, before Weinstein, I wrote an article about women's tendency to second-guess their experience of sexual harassment. And I was quite chuffed because I managed to weave in quite an elaborate Dolly Parton metaphor. So I went back to my fav one of my favorite films, Nine to Five, and I don't know if you remember, but you know, women second guess their experiences is, was it really that bad? Should I have done something? Should I have done something? And they, I don't know about you, but when it's happened to me, I've always had fantasies, alternative narratives, things I would have done. And Dolly Parton does too. So her character in the film, there's a great scene, a wonderful gif of it, if anyone's interested, of where she sort of rides in on a horse and she lassoes him and she ties him up like a steer at a rodeo and you know we can't all be Dolly Parton nor should we have to be and so whose responsibility is it to change the culture and certainly I think it's men's responsibility in what we call kind of bystander action and that's not for men to kind of actively intervene when they see a violent situation unfolding in front of them it's for men to intervene in all those acts of everyday sexism that add up to this culture in the mm. Petri dish. Um, but it's also, like you talked about it, you went to a man and said this happened to me and he just looked for an excuse, didn't mm. he? I think Quentin Tarantino was, yeah, interesting apology, non-apology there. He was talking about when Mira Sorvino came up to him and told him about what had happened with Harvey Weinstein. He thought, oh, well maybe that quickness to look for an excuse, to look for a reason so you don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. That's what they're looking for. And they have to stop doing that, and they have to do something. And there's been research that shows that men don't do it because they assume that everybody in the room is more sexist than they are. They think they're the only ones. And actually, you're not the only ones. You know, men, let's give men some credit. Let's hope, God, if we can't say this, then we're really fucked. I think in a lot of situations, a lot of men would sort of stand behind you if you said something, so say something. But we not only need men to stand up to men, like stand up to the man, but I think we have to stand up to the fucking system, stand up to the, you know, the patriarchy, the kind of culture that we're awash in that gives women less power. And it's not just about women having less power in situations of sexual assault and harassment, but it's about women having less power generally. Everywhere. Well, Everywhere. that's why it's no great surprise in Hollywood, because look at the amount of women who are allowed to write or direct movies. Look at the topics of the movies. Look at how many women to men there are represented in movies. Not long ago, my friend and I, a bus went by, we were sitting out in front of a cafe, and on the bus it was advertising a movie, and there were four men on the poster, and one woman, and the woman had her mouth open like this, like, oh. And I just said to my friend, is that the world you live in? Four men and one woman who looks like she's about mm. to give oral sex. And she went, no, it's not the world that is represented. I said, do you think that's the world the men who've made that movie live in? And she said, no, it's the world they want to live in. And I said, why don't they want more women in their world, though? And she said, because they want it to be a competition. They want to say, there's only one hot girl and I win her over all my friends. And I was like, that is so awful. But while that persists, you cannot expect the power abuse to go away magically. You can't have over half of films not passing the Bechdel test, but 
Harvey Weinstein not wanking into a pop plant. Like, it doesn't work that way. I mean, that's Except a very that specific more example. If more films passed the Bechdel done. test, this wouldn't have happened. I agree. And I internationally, so. we know that research shows us that in societies where women experience more equality, there's lower rates of violence against women. So mm. maybe we should start seeing if there's a correlation between the two and tracking that more closely. That's interesting. Is that true? Where there's more equality, like Scandinavia? Yes, exactly. Violence prevention work is very much on the basis that if you create a more equal society for women, you will prevent violence against women and do lots of other good things at the same time. It's efficient. We're efficient feminists. Can I say that works in the favor of men as well? If men are listening to this and thinking, what's in that for me, if they're thinking in a very mercenary way, it works the same way because one thing that men often complain about is lack of parental rights. And in Sweden, where men and women are given equal opportunity for maternity and paternity leave, and it actually works that both parents, both caregivers, get a certain amount between them, but they can't take it all unless both of them take a considerable amount. So it's not just, oh, well, one of you can take nine months. It doesn't work that way. So because they work in a culture where in lots of ways they reward co-parenting, when divorces happen, they tend to decide between the couple and the child where the child lives and how often they go to each parent's house. And they just don't have the same problems that we do in other countries about fighting over children. It's kind of gone because what they've done is they've taken that the woman looks after the child out of the culture. Exactly. And the man is excluded from that out of the culture. Yeah. Let us count the ways that equality would be good for men. We know that men have higher rates of suicide. We know they have higher rates of mental health issues. And, you know, what's the common theme behind all this? Toxic masculinity. And it's the men and boys who don't adhere to those standards who suffer horribly as well. How do you feel about the whole Me Too uh, situation? Do you feel... Because some people have been saying, well, women shouldn't have to flaunt their oppression or confess their trauma. Like, you know, it's traumatic to dredge it up for many yeah. women. I don't know if you've been reading a lot about this. I've read a few different points of view. Sort of Jessica Valenti, who I greatly admire, US-based feminist, made, I think, a perfectly valid point. You know, there are women who've been saying this for so long. Why should we have to sort of flail ourselves once again to prove how bad the problem is? And, you know, I take that point, and I've had the great privilege of working with a lot of women and men with lived experience of violence. And there's a lot of ethics around that, and it's really important that they're supported. But I don't think in this particular instance, the women who are coming forward are doing it to prove how bad the problem is. I think that they're doing it because for so long, if they came forward, they wouldn't have been listened to. They wouldn't have been believed. They would have been dismissed. And we know from research, about 75% of them actually would have been punished. And it's so valuable for women who've experienced sexual assault and domestic violence to be listened to, to be believed. I feel like we're undergoing a collective mm. social exercise of doing that now, listening and believing. believing. You know how you talked yeah. about reframing these stories? They're not a funny story. We're just listening to these women and we're believing them. And for so many of these women, it'll be hugely emotional. They would never have told these stories or they never would have told these stories that way. Mm. So I think that that's really important. And I wouldn't deny women who maybe haven't felt comfortable speaking out about this, like some feminist commentators, may feel more comfortable speaking out about it. Their moment to do that. Well, I thought Cal's point was good that, you know, when you said that sometimes a man will say, oh, no, he wouldn't have said that. Yep. And I think in general, this has been my experience, when I've had trauma around this particular subject matter, sometimes I've confided in a friend and they've said, a male or a female friend, they've said, well, maybe you misunderstood, or maybe he yep. didn't mean it that way. And then when I see in the press that, why didn't you come out earlier about Cosby or whatever? They probably did come out to somebody. You don't come out the first time. You don't walk out the door and shout it into the street. They came out to a friend and went, this just happened with Bill Cosby. He gave me quaaludes. And I woke up and I didn't know where I was. And they went, well, did you take them? Yeah, yeah. Like, because if you took them, or he offered them to me and I left, we can't really say anything about that, can you? Because maybe they were painkillers. Maybe they were just aspirin. Mm. I think we need to start believing each other a lot more. It's like uh, we were both saying about have people want to come back to the path of least resistance. Like they want to come back to, oh, what's the easiest thing to do here? It would be the easiest thing would be if that didn't happen. Like the mm. easiest thing would be if you were mistaken and he was trying to give you a neurofin and 
you thought he was trying to and roofie he's still you. Dr. Yeah. Huxtable, who I love. Yes, and yeah. then I don't that have to... That would be great. Yeah, I don't and have to throw away my childhood love of Bill Cosby albums and I don't have to not see my friend that I go drinking with on a Friday night now that I know that he hits you. Like, you know, I was in a terrible relationship and when I told people that it was an abusive relationship, their thing was just to kind of go, oh, I didn't, I couldn't hear it. It's like, it's almost sometimes like the truth is too big to fit in people's ears. Like it just kind of glances off mm. and they're like, but if I accept that from you, then I have to adjust my behavior and my life is impacted by a thing that someone else did. So it's just better if I just say you're a crazy woman. Mm. Like there's that. Which we all understand. It's a bit like packaging them as funny stories. We all understand denial. We're human. And we can only cope with so much trauma. And there are times when we do just kind of laugh something off or shake it off or go, I can't think he really... Did that mm. really happen? Mm. Or, you know, that kind of thing. Where the first time, if you're groped on public transport, it's really easy to go, obviously they just brushed past me. Mm. And you know the difference between someone brushing past you and somebody grabbing you. Although that story you told me about Dancing with Stars... <laughs> that so, demonstrates that's not always true. No. Shall I tell it? Yeah, go on. Okay, so I did Dancing with the Stars about 10 years ago, and it was just getting to that point where you go, I don't know which one's the celebrity and which one's the dancer. You know, it was getting to that <laughs> point. And then you dance, and they go, oh, by default, that must be the dancer because she is appalling. So, um, so I had this fantastic dancer who was very down to earth. His dance partner was his girlfriend and I was married and the first thing he said to me was there's going to be no funny business right there's not going to be any sexual shenanigans between the two of us we are dancing for this program because things do get heated there have been affairs I don't want to you know destroy your illusions but sometimes dancers hook up with their stars and so right from the start he was like this is not going to happen and I was like well that is great because I am married like so um, that was all great and then uh, we'd been doing the show for a few weeks and then we were rehearsing a tango at one morning it was about six o'clock in the morning because we were rehearsing for five hours a day and so he pulls me in. There's a lot of kind of pelvic connection in a tango. And he pulls me in. And uh, we start dancing. And I'm like, oh, my God, I can feel something. I can feel something hard. Oh, my God, I can feel his erection. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And I started to freak out. But I was like, he does not seem bothered. Let's just keep dancing while I figure out what I'm going to do. And so we're dancing. It's about a minute and a half. And I'm like, oh, maybe it's just a physiological reaction. And it's like it happens all the time to professional dancers. So he's just not paying any attention. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I've given him an erection. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And then we break apart as part of the dance. And I look down. And it's the knot of his jumper. <laughs> exceptions it's important to remember <laughs> do we have any questions from the audience yes question that uh, Megan gave Alexander an awesome knockdown uh, in the emails that you read at the beginning oh yes do you guys have any examples of knockdown uh, go-to lines that we could use if we're ever uh, in a situation either as a bystander or as a recipient of unwanted attention. And by the way, Deborah, I do love your not cool. Uh, oh, yeah. Not something cool, like yeah. that. That is my go to. And a lot of people say that they've used it. If you've not listened to the podcast or that episode, I have a recommendation that I, I just spontaneously did it once. Where in the street, I just went to this man who grabbed my necklace as a sort of, I think, like a game flirtation thing where he was just trying to lure me in. But we weren't like chatting in a bar. I was walking down the street and I was like, I must have been walking slowly on my phone or something, but he just thought that was the way to get my attention and he pulls me in like that. I know I always wear these long necklaces and I was so shocked, but I never like to be hostile and cause a fight because I fear I will not win it and not to go vulnerable and go, oh, I'm, you really upset me because then I feel like the power balance is off. So I get very businesslike. My instinct is always going to infomercial mode. <laughs> just so businesslike, but really high status. And my instinct was just to put my arms up like that and go, not cool! And that did stop him. That did stop him. Um, it did stop him. It's, um, because men... And we talked about this after I talked about this another time. And you told me there was some evidence that this works, that men don't like to be told they're not cool. That it's... <laughs> it lowers their status. But just hearing your question, I sort of froze because I'm sort of putting myself in that situation. 
and I'm freezing. And that's what women do. I mean, we know that when women are experiencing everyday sexism and that, that kind of harassment, and when women are experiencing sexual assault, that's what we do. We freeze. So it would be good to get some tips. Not cool. That'd be good. I feel like I don't have a specific line or anything, but what I've been thinking about is I think just to fight your own embarrassment and be loud, like mm. to even if it's like, get your tiny pathetic hands off me, you fucking cock. Like, like... <laughs> Like just, just no. to draw attention because we freeze and we go, oh God, this is awful and I don't want to draw attention to myself and I should be able to cope with this and like we go into that. But I think if you draw everyone else's attention, then you have other people looking at you mm. and th they're not going to want that attention. I think embarrassment so. is the worst thing. I'm sure at the time you said to me, there's some evidence that like adverts, I remember in Australia years ago, there was an advert to sort of discourage teenagers from smoking. And what they'd done is they'd got the kids from neighbors. Ah, yes. It was just like a hidden camera on the kids from neighbors in the dressing room chatting. And they were mocking school kids smoking. And they were going, oh, you see them with the shifty eyes. And they look away and it's like, and they were basically saying how embarrassing it was to see teenagers in school uniforms smoking and how embarrassed they felt for them. And that was a really successful campaign because the kids from Neighbours were the coolest thing. <laughs> yes. I'm now remembering what it was I was on at you about. Yes, yeah, great. That particular, because I've said so many profound things to Deb it's over It's true. The, that I had she to go has. back in the archives and think, what profound thing was that? But now I remember. So um, when I worked at Our Watch, we did a youth uh, social marketing respectful relationships campaign called The Line. And not me, but my lovely esteemed colleague, Maddie, did all the sort of audience insight work for that. And we did an advertising campaign and a TV commercial. And what came out was that if you're going to kind of frame a commercial that says to a young man, don't be an asshole, what will work? What will get inside their head? And it was that the status was the most important thing, that they were going to be thought less of, but particularly by their male peers. And in an ideal world, you'd like to be able to sort of, you know, show the impact of that crime on the girl and have that be the aha moment for a potential perpetrator out there to go, oh, oh gosh, that's an awful thing. And I wouldn't want to have that impact on someone. But it's actually potentially being thought less of by mm. your peers. And it's this kind of question of, you know, well, we are where we are. So do we use that information and do we try to create change with that? We must, because what fixes it is what's important. And that's not to say we also don't work on empathy and all of those other things. But if we've got any research on what fixes it, then we need to go for it. And that really, that evidence really speaks to the Weinstein culture, because he had the most status in Hollywood. Mm. And clearly, he was not, you know, the stories, things happening in restaurants, him inviting women up to their rooms, as if people didn't know. Now, I'm not saying everybody knew, but I'm saying enough people must have known that that kind of thing happened and went on. If it was a status robber for men, then it's not. You watch Entourage, it's a status giver. Yeah. Entourage is based on a deep chasm between, if you don't know it, it's a television show about young men living in Hollywood, and a, it's based on a deep chasm between the genders and an othering of women. That's the gag of the whole show, really. These young men having the time of their lives shagging women, completely bonded together. They are the tribe, they are the group. No girlfriend can get in the way or come between the way that the boys bond. The way Johnny Drama talks about women on that show is so horrifying to me. I just can't, and clearly I've watched lots of it. <laughs> but but I, was, I was kind of gripped to it and going, this is almost like a documentary for me. And there are times when it's fun, it's a funny story. You know, like it's, it's time when it's fun to sort of watch the guys succeed in, you know, making their own movie and then selling it and then, well, you know... you're doing blah. your own sort of audience insight research. Yeah, you were but, trying to figure out, like, what's making this tick? What's, yeah, but, what, what are but, the ingredients yeah. But it was based on Mark Wahlberg's own experience of turning up in Hollywood, having a half-brother who was older and sort of more established but not so much of a star, all of the things that are in it. It's based on Mark Wahlberg's experience. It's like a docudrama. We all knew. We all knew. It had eight seasons. And I fear that what they're doing now with Weinstein is going, he can't be saved, throw him to the wolves. Mm. And we'll make a big bonfire, a big Guy Fawkes bonfire, and go, Weinstein, yes, we all disapprove, we all disapprove. So we can all continue doing this low-level bullshit over here, some of which is extremely abusive, some of which is just everyday horrifying misogyny, and we're going to keep this going, because if we don't throw him now, if we don't throw him out of the pack and let the jackals eat him, our whole way of life is fucked. And I think we need to keep pushing back and keep asking the questions. If you don't want the Weinstein culture, 
Why are you greenlighting so many movies that don't pass the Bechdel test? And more than that, there's more than the Bechdel test with female characters designed by women, created by women, written by women, with women of color in, with women. Why? Why does it have to be five men and one woman? Why can't it be five women and one men? And then not presented as a chick flick. Like, why? Why can't we have that? In addition to being a chartered feminist, I also moonlight occasionally as a sunny optimist feminist. (laughs) And I really have cracked open my last tin of sunny feminist optimism, and I'm crawling out of the backlash bunker. And I just think the context has changed. And I think this has gone beyond throwing one to the wolves. He was really channeling that context in his statement and saying, you know, I hope I'll be given a second chance. And I kind of think... Second chance for what, four decades yeah. of oppression. Yes, exactly. And, and as Cal said earlier, what is it, a 40th chance, 50th chance, 300th chance? I think we're beyond that now. I have to believe that after having kind of worked in one way or another for so bloody long, I just have to pry open that last tin. I really do think there's been a fundamental change. Honestly, we need to have campaigns where every time a movie comes out that doesn't pass the Bechdel test, we all write to the studio and say, we noticed this. Um, And, you know, we noticed that you've made X amount of films with male leads that are about male experiences. Could we have some female non-binary experiences, please? We noticed that this many experiences are white. Can we have some experiences of people of color? Like, we need to start asking for this I stuff. I think it's going to lead to this kind of creative renaissance, really, because in the last couple of years, like with Genji Cohen, we've just seen so much great stuff increasingly mm. coming, creative things coming from women. And if this kind of bullshit Petri dish isn't there anymore, can you imagine what will happen if you don't have to, you know, massage oh. Harvey Weinstein to get your, yeah. your script greenlighted and, and, all of the and the women who will be able gaze. to tell amazing stories. Well, there's so many stories that haven't been told. Yeah. But I would think, honestly, genuinely think that white straight men would be sick of it. Because I'm like, can I hear something else? Because I don't want to hear about my experience all the time. I enjoy seeing movies and reading books from other experiences. Um, I, did, I feel like I didn't answer your question. And I feel like we've not really answered it. My two things, one would be cows, because I have a friend who's incredibly feisty, and on public transport, she was grabbed between the legs. In really rush hour London, it was like everyone's sort of up against each other. I would go, oh, God, he must be just, oh, I'll just edge away. But she said I knew exactly what he was doing, so I said incredibly loudly on the tube when nobody speaks ever. (laughs) She said, get your fucking hand off my fucking cunt. (laughs) Because it's about power, and she made him feel embarrassed and small. And she thought, I wanted to discourage him from doing it again, because if he thinks that's how women are going to react, and there's no... It's not, I know I've got other friends who've totally frozen. If you've frozen and you haven't done that, that is absolutely 100% more than okay. It's a survival response. But feel empowered to say, get your fucking hand off my fucking cunt. And another friend of mine was in a meeting with a guy, someone who was a bit senior to her at that point, And he just went, I bet you'd give a great blowjob. And she said, could you repeat that, please? (laughs) And he went, oh. She went, sorry, what? No, what did you say? And he went, oh. I reckon if you've got a Weinstein opposite you and they say, will you watch me shower? And he's probably the exception. But for a lot of low-level Weinsteins who are trying to affect that behavior, if you went, so sorry, just to clarify, you're asking me who's a business associate to have a shower with you can I just clarify what the exchange is here just repeat it back to me and I reckon a lot of them at that point again because it's a power thing if you're then like a school teacher making them repeat it back they just crumble I am sure Weinstein he was so high on his own supply of narcissism I'm sure he and Trump if you said that to Donald Trump he'd say I said do you want to get in the shower with me I got the greatest shower she kept this one hand here this one, bring me one who can hear. I've repeated it five times, and she's still not in the show. Yeah, you oh, I don't understand. Pence, Pence, where's Pence? Get in here. Tell this one to get in the shower. Probably, but, you know, there's a lot of men who wouldn't. Again, if you don't have the whatever it is in that moment to do that, that is not on you. You've got permission. Don't ever feel you don't have permission because society is going, mm, take permission. Um... Can I 
we're about to I'm start a feminist a mixed show. Oh, yes. Feminist challenge? Yes, please. Okay. Please, please, of course. So my feminist challenge was to do I'm in a feminist butt. Because when Deb asked me to come on the show, my husband, who's also friends with Deb, said, but why would she do that? You're not funny. <laughs> To I which mean, I responded, well, when we usually go to Deb's house, you and her husband swap your Columbo DVDs. So who are you to talk? <laughs> <laughs> which he denies now. In its he says that they didn't swap Columbo DVDs. They totally they did. They totally did. They, they did. were all, our husbands totally swapped Columbo DVDs. Columbo. Yes, they did. Yeah, that's yes. not a euphemism. Yes. <laughs> so my I'm a feminist, but... I'm a feminist, but one of the most influential feminist texts I've read in the past few weeks is the Ruth Bader Ginsburg workout. How she stays strong, and you can too. (laughs) And I have found it very helpful, because this feminism stuff is a marathon, not a sprint, and we all need to stay strong. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a woman of mature years, isn't she? Like, is it quite a slow, careful workout? Like, no. The reason I cottoned on to this was because, you know, when Trump was elected, people thought, fuck, you know, the Supreme Court, I wonder how that Ruth's getting on. So they sent the political correspondent, I think from Slate, I can't remember, to find out what her workout routine was. And apparently she's quite spry and very fit. And that inspired her fitness instructor to write a book. And I have been following Ruth's fitness advice, Bader Fitness Goals, hashtag, for some time now. (laughs) I have That's the most feminist thing I've ever heard. (laughs) You are a chartered feminist, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter what anyone says. You are doing the Ruth Bader Ginsburg fitness challenge. I I feel like we need to get Christina a t-shirt that has hashtag Bader Fitness Goals. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, she's like someone to follow. She's made of steel, that woman. And do you have anything to plug? Any articles we should look at? Or we just... You can find it all on Twitter. I write frequently for Women's Agenda. I also write for Daily Life. And um, sometimes I write for News Corp. So follow me on Twitter. And I, I put everything up there. And you can read my thoughts and musings. And Deb won't have to listen to me all the time. No, I love listening to you. I find Christina's writing really intelligent, really on the mark, really practical, really relevant. And also funny. So He's Richard really can do one. Um, <laughs> can suck it at K Zivica, Z-I-W-I-C-A. And I'm sort of new to the journalism thing, so I think I've got 80 followers. So if you all follow me after this, that'll be great. Then I'll, then I'll be totally legit. Uh, all right. Do you have anything to plug, Cal Wilson? Um, I'm on Twitter at Calbo, C-A-L-B-O. Um, nothing to do with body odor. It's just my nickname, Calbo. But, ooh, stinky Cal. Um, <laughs> I have instructions for you all in a loving way. Follow the Guilty Feminist on Twitter. It's at GuiltFemPod. Check out our Instagram, Instagram.com slash The Guilty Feminist. Like our Facebook page. Sign up to our mailing list to get notified as soon as a new episode is released. Please go to iTunes and rate, review, and subscribe. All you need to do is click as many stars as you want out of five as long as it's five. <laughs> because that helps other people to find the podcast. It really does. I'm at Deborah FW, and I'd also love you to listen to Global Pillage at globalpillage.net and also download our negotiation special uh, where Athena Cabrera and I interview a hostage negotiator. That's the only episode you can buy. All the rest are totally free. It's five pounds. But during this month, all the money goes to uh, Leila Hussein's anti-FGM counselling programme, the only one of its kind in Europe. I know you're not in Europe personally, but... They like to travel, though. The world, Yeah. <laughs> You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Rocky White, guest co host, Carl Wilson, and very special guest, Christina the Wicker, the producer of Tom Kalinsky from the Spot of Asia Shop, the sound engineer was Ali Graham. Thanks to everyone at Giant Hall, as well as Jeff Ring and Australia Comedy Management, and all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes of The Guilty Feminist, I feel like some of you think this is a real letter <laughs> and are going, they didn't send, no, I've written this as satire, just to be clear. <clears throat> the Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.